I can make it to, to stay around the equilibrium point. I wrote down a bunch of very important equations for uh, today's lecture. These are the two Lyapunov equations that we talked about last time. The first is the continuous time Lyapunov equation A. So I'm going to read it out because these transposes are going to be uh, important in today's lecture. So it's A transpose P plus PA equals negative Q. And then the solution, if it exists, is going to be EA transpose T Q E A T D T. And then in the discrete time case, it's the same. A transpose, the transpose goes first, and then P A minus P equal to negative Q. Solution is going to be transpose K Q A K, the summation. The Lyapunov the equations, they have conditions for this solution to exist. So for the first one, the condition is that you can see that this is like, like A A appearing twice. So the condition is that if you take any eigenvalues of A, and you add it up, you add two eigenvalues of A together. If they don't equal to 0, then it's going to have a solution. So you can see that this is actually very similar. You can get some intuition out of it. This is A, A, add up together. And then if you think about the solution condition for this one to exist, is eigenvalue of A times eigenvalue of A. Pick any two, time them together. Then if that solution uh, is less than 1, then it's not equal to 1, then you're going to have a solution to exist. Right? So for our cases, if A is like if the associated system for x dot equal AX is stable, then all the eigenvalue of A is going to be on the left half plane, then the solution will be guaranteed to exist. Same thing for here. Uh, if the associated AX k plus 1 the associated system xk plus 1 equal to axk is stable, then the solution is going to be guaranteed to exist. All right? So let's see how these equations will be used for today's lecture. Controllability and observability. This is my favorite topic, actually, so far. Now, let's bring up the concepts first. What do we mean by controllability and observability? We already talked about controllable canonical form and observable canonical form. Let's see what do they really mean intuitively. If you think about the system that we have been dealing with, x dot equal to ax plus bu, or in the discrete time case, xk plus 1 equal to axk plus buk, you can see that immediately the input u does not directly act on the state. right? It has to go through this dynamics equation. So, can the input drive the system to any state space, to any value in the state space? Can this input u, after it goes through this B matrix, can it impact x like arbitrarily in the state space and over a finite time? That's a question of whether the system is controllable or not, whether the state can be arbitrarily stirred by the input or not. All right? So that's the key concept. The input do not act directly on the state, but it goes through this state dynamics. Similarly, for the output side, you can see that the output y, usually it doesn't directly equal to x. In other words, if you just take a look at y, you don't directly see the state. You see some kind of uh, manipulated or modified information of the state. So the state are not all measured directly, but instead it impacts output via this output equation. So once you get a bunch of outputs, can we like tell where the state is? <coughs> so that's the question of observability. And more specifically, this is what we can state a little bit more formally. So can we infer like the initial state from this output and input information. So this is the only thing that we need to be careful about, the initial state. Because once we know the initial state, right? if you take a look at the discrete time equation here, if I know where things start, 
and I know like the input is what we provide, so we, we know the input. Once we know the initial state and the input, then through this equation, the system equation, we can know any state at any given time once this initial state is obtained, right? So we can, re we can review the full state trajectory through this equation one. So that's the concept of controllability and observability. Now, one example, one famous example that I, I like very much is the example of an uh, inverted pendulum on a car. So imagine if I have an inverted pendulum like I do it here, I'm doing a two-dimensional, so I'm, my, my hand can move in two-dimensional space. But uh, uh, one starting point that uh, we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit more is if I move like horizontally and uh, the pendulum is constrained to move in just like a 2D plane. But if you take a look at the 3D plane, you can see that I can, by controlling the position at the end of the inverted pendulum, I can control the position and velocity of the tip of the pendulum, right? I can make it, uh, I'm doing a bad job here, I can make it to, to stay around the equilibrium point, right? So that is controllable by my command at the end of the beam, I can control the system position and velocity at the top. All right? So you can, let me switch back to the desktop. All right? So I provided examples about how the system can be modeled, the state equation. And uh, I don't want to go into these, but instead, I'm going to show you two demonstrations. So I did in class like one degree of freedom inverted pendulum. Now what's amazing is if you have multiple degree of freedom, multiple uh, double pendulum, triple pendulum, you can see just by controlling the position at the end, at the bottom of the pendulum, you can see it can control the state. Right? So in this time, both the position, you can, you can take a look here, so both the position at this joint and the position at the, he's going to swing up the next joint, and the position velocity of this joint, both of them can be controlled by just uh, the position, horizontal position of the card. All right, and this is a very well designed controller. You can see how amazing, how important control is. Question? When designing a control like this for a system, how good does your you know, modeling of you know, the fluid friction, even the coulombic friction, need to be? So for this one, it's pretty. The friction is very minimal. Um, it's a very com It's a slightly complicated problem. Um, but uh, if you have the friction coefficient, the the result is that you can still control the system. Yeah, but you gotta. You, the better your model is, the better control you can do. Another question? What would like the sensors that they're using here be? Are they using like a camera to track the position of where the pendulum is? Or yeah. So for this one, I didn't dig into, but very common in there are like demo kits we can buy. Uh, they have so the rotation angle can be measured. So there will be an angular encoder type of thing that can measure. So what you talk about is actually something that I want to try. Mm -hmm. So have a camera and then measure out these angles in real time. That's actually not so easy. Yeah, a lot of issues can, uh, can happen. Another question? So um, I'm assuming there's a lot of different paths you can take to get to these equilibrium positions. Is this just doing the most efficient path, I'm assuming? Is that uh, what for this sense? one, probably not. Yeah, so it depends totally on how you design the controller. There are different kinds of control designs for sure. Yeah, so let's take a look at another one. It's even...
So let's take a look at this one, three degree of freedom. And then you can still, by controlling just the position at the, on the card, you can control the system. It's a controllable system. All right. So this is something that uh, I find it difficult to do, a double pendulum. It's difficult for me. It's even challenging for me to do this single pendulum. But uh, uh, a computer, if you design the controller well, you can do this. Another question? Uh, yeah. What happens when it starts going unstable towards the edge of whatever the motor can move? Like if it's tipping to the left, it can't really compensate by going out, right? So mm -hmm. do they define the problem well enough? Or yeah, for this one, I think is. The controller is designed around the equilibrium point that's uh, pointing upward. And uh, if it goes too much, then the system is going to be like uh, f too far away from the equilibrium, and the controller may perform not as well. Yeah. All right. So these two problems, the, the two videos is going to show you is the purpose is to show you that uh, the system is controllable. Uh, double pendulum, triple pendulum is controllable. And if you uh, try in MATLAB, this one, MATLAB has already built in a double pendulum example for you in the, uh, in the demo problems. So you can run this command, and it's going to show up a double pendulum design. I will uh, not talk about it today. And uh, what I want to mention is if you think about the pendulum again. What I did is I did this. I can do this still. I can, I can kind of do this. Now, let me talk about another uh, concept that's also important. This is just about controllability, whether I can control the system. And then there is this also a concept like how easy it is to control the system, right? So this is easier, but if I try to do this one, this is much lighter than this pendulum here. And it's going to be much, much more difficult to, to, to stand up. So, so uh, yeah, it's, it's extremely difficult, actually. So uh, the system, depending on how you design the system, the system can be very easily controlled and can be very difficult to control. So that's a problem as engineer that we should be thinking about, right? So the weight is important. What do you think something else, design parameter, is also going to be important? Sickness, how do you define sickness? Uh, the cross-sectional surface Density of the stiffness. All right, so density is the same as like the weight, right? So stiffness, that's a good one. Uh, if it's like a flexible material, that's definitely going to be more difficult to control. That, uh, that is actually uh, entirely a different class of system. If it's a stiff material, that's actually a uh, very good problem uh, that um, involve nonlinear system analysis. Now, another, another thing that some of you mentioned is the height, right? So if it's taller, it's easier to, con to stabilize, to control, right? You see here, I do a much better job, all right? So all these problems are so uh, very interesting. Controllability, observability, how easy it is to control. So. With these concepts in mind, let's talk about more formally. Now, if I give you a system, how do we quantify whether it's controllable or not? So first, let's talk about this example. So this is a cart, two carts on the ground. Let's say there's two springs. It's a symmetric system. So two springs, two dampers, the same mass. Oops. Why did it? Uh... All right. Thank you. So symmetric system, two mass, two spring, and two dampers. And the uh, control is applied to the mass. And it's doing a symmetric control input to the two masses. Now. Let's talk about controllability. The system has four states, like the position, 
because I have two mass. Each mass has position velocity as the state variable. So I have one, two, three, four, four states. And uh, the control, if you think about how it's applied, you can see that, let's say, originally the system is symmetric. The initial position velocity at zero. Then if you apply the symmetric force to the two masses, you can see the most Is it better now? Sure. All right, so we're going to start from discrete time first because it's easier to go that way. So the full definition is as follows. Now let's say our system is xk plus 1 equal to ak, xk plus bk uk. So this definition works for both time varying and time invariant systems. This is called controllable at k equal to 0 if there exists a finite time such that for any initial state and the target state, there exists a control sequence that's going to transfer the system from x0 to x1. So the picture in the two-dimensional system, it looks like this. So let's say we have an initial state, and then I want to go to somewhere x1. So if the system is controllable, it has to be able to have a control sequence, let's say u1, u0, and then u1, and then let's say it can go three steps to here, u2. So it has to be finite time. It has, you have to be able to reach to here in finite time because if it takes forever for you to go from here to here, then it's not so much interesting. So it's a finite time sequence that's going to go from, if you pick uh, any target state, any initial state and target state, it's going to be able to do that, not just like a specific point. All right. So for time invariant system, that's very easy to do in discrete time. So we talked about the solution, right? If you know the system equation, then you can write out the solution. You can write out x at time n as a function of the initial state and whatever control input that you apply. So if you write it uh, slightly differently, this is what we talked about. So uh, let's shift the terms. Let's say xn minus an x0. So on the right-hand side is this summation. So is, if you think about it, in essence, it is actually a linear combination of the inputs from 0 to n minus 1. All right? And uh, the matrix has a very specific structure. So B, A, B, A squared B, all the way to A and minus 1 B, times this long vector collected from all the inputs from 0 to N minus 1. All right? So the question of controllability, you see, is as follows. If I pick any Xn, X0, right, giving any <coughs> terminal state and initial state, can we solve this equation? Can we figure out the control sequence that's going to give us a solution to this equation, matrix equation? All right? So if I talk about, if, if you take a look at the dimension of the, the, uh, the matrix equation, it looks as follows. So if B, let's say this is uh, dimensions, this is n by n, and B, the dimension of B depends on the dimension of input. If my input is 1, then this is n by 1. If my input is, let's say, r, if I have r input, then this should look like, b should look like, in general, let's say it's two-dimensional, so it has two columns, 
right? So B usually is a skinny matrix, tall matrix. So the dimension of this one is therefore, you can see it has B, B, B. So the row number is whatever, num whatever number of rows B has. So it has N rows. The dimension is N rows. And then the column number, if B has two has R columns, A B has R columns, then then all the way it has n terms in this matrix. So the dimension of the column is n times R. Alright? So the matrix PD in general it looks like it has either as many columns as the rows or it has more columns than the rows. So it will look like something that like this. That's the dimension. So it is a wide matrix, potentially. It is a wide matrix if I have if R is larger than one. If I have multiple inputs. If I have just one input, then it's a square matrix. So under what condition can we solve this equation? That depends entirely on the uh, the rank condition for this matrix PB, right? So if PB has rank n, all right. So if PB has rank n, right, and then this side the dimension is n by one, so it looks like this. So if the matrix has rank n, right, then you can see that we can come up with a sequence to reach any n by one vector. Because it has full rank, it spans, the columns of this matrix spans the Rn. So if you give me any matrix uh, n by one, I can solve this equation. So uh, the condition is this has rank n. And uh, if you take a look at the dimensions, n is the full row rank. All right? So that's the condition for this to be solvable. All right? So putting in uh, for a little bit more perspective. So now we know that the condition for this to be solvable is this has full rank, full row rank. Question? You just explain again why that means uh, full row rank or it could be equal to Alright, so two elements first. So the first element is Treat this, let's go from column perspective. This has a lot of columns, right? So this matrix multiplying the sequence is just a linear combination of all the columns, right? If these columns span Rn, then we can we can easily solve this. There the always exists a solution, right? Because this spans Rn. So it can represent any n by one vector. Now the condition that this spans Rn, the column spans Rn is that there are unlinearly independent column vector, right? So the dimension, the rank of this matrix is N in that case. And uh, uh, N happens to be, if you take a look at the dimension that we talked about, is the row rank, is the number of rows. So that's how it's defined. All right. So uh, that's the concept, that's, a, that's the first concept. And then the second concept is as follows. You may wonder, right, so here we pick, we, we went to just n minus one, all right? So why don't we go further, right? If I have more control input, it's intuitively, uh, it's intuitive that I can even, uh, even go, if I have more columns to choose from, I can even go to more dimensions. I can span the uh, space if I have more columns. So it turns out you don't need to go. It turns out you don't need to, in this in constructing this matrix, you don't need to go beyond n components in here. You only need to go from 0 to n minus 1. All right, so if you add, if you continue add a n, B, A, N plus 1, B, it wouldn't help you, all right? So the minimum 
required number of steps is n, it turns out, all right? So this is the concept in the so-called Cayley-Hamilton theory. This is a very powerful theory, all right? So you don't have to, once you reach to here, you don't need to go beyond. These uh, additional columns will not help you, all right? So the uh, underlying reason is that this an, okay, you can see uh, a appears, you have a power series of a. So the reason is that if you add a n b, a n plus one b, wouldn't help you because a n is linearly dependent. So it turns out once you give these, once you have these, you can express a n by linear combination of these terms. All right, so you don't have to go beyond uh, n here. So this theorem is uh, two people, two mathematicians contributed to the theorem. So the first one is Arthur Cayley. All right, so this is a uh, British mathematician. So it's in the 18th century. And then the second, uh, Hamilton, is uh, William Hamilton. This is also in the 18th century. This is uh, Irish mathematician. So both of them are very successful mathematicians. And uh, today I want to mention a few things on William Hamilton. So he discovered a lot of things. So this is one of them in linear algebra. Uh, there's also one thing that he invented that is relevant to control systems. So he invented something called, uh, when, when we talk about modeling of spacecraft, right? So that's a three-dimensional uh, model over there. So he invented something called quaternion. Well, all right, so um, he was initially, he has been thinking about the problem for a while. Like, we have pretty good understanding of complex numbers, right? So if you can put it in a two-dimensional space, the complex number works perfectly over there. So the complex numbers, it has the, uh, property that a i squared or j squared equal to negative one. And he has been thinking about the problem, he wanted to generalize this to higher dimensional systems. Uh, three dimensional, four dimensional, five dimensional. And uh, uh, it turns out to be complicated. He succeeded in generalizing to four dimensional case, 4D case. So one day he was taking a walk with his wife and uh, all of a sudden, he came up to this equation. I square, J square, K square equal to I, I, J, K equal to negative one. Uh, and then he, he immediately felt this is actually the, the definition in four dimensional case that he has been thinking about, okay? so. He introduced this ijk equal to negative one new term over here. And this uh, was eventually went to the modeling of spacecrafts uh, in uh, attitude control. and uh, uh, computer uh, graphics signal processing as well. All right, so instead of going, once you, if you work on like a three dimensional geometric problem, you will soon realize that if you have multiple degree of freedom model of spacecraft, the dynamic equation with that is gonna be massive. It's gonna be really complicated. And uh, this approach, if you use quaternion, 
then it's going to simplify the result quite a bit. So he was so excited during his work about figuring out this equation, so he carved this equation into a bridge, I believe. So he carved this equation into a bridge along the walk, and then uh, that walk, that path, that trail, is now a very famous trail, actually. So it's called uh, Hamilton Walk nowadays. Okay. So that's something interesting about Hamilton. All right, so let's come back to this, this powerful result that uh, uh, AN can be linearly expressed by combinations of I, A, A squared to A, N minus one. All right, so the proof is actually not difficult. So the proof goes as follows. So for a matrix, we have this characteristic polynomial, right? When we compute the eigenvalues, determinant lambda i minus a. So it is a polynomial equation. So if it has uh, lambda 1 to lambda p, these n eigenvalues, some of them may, may be repetitive. You can, can have multiplicity as well. But uh, it can be decomposed into these. That's how we compute the eigenvalues. So the proof goes as follows. So if you substitute lambda with a, then you get this uh, p a, this polynomial of a, is a minus lambda 1 i all the way multiplied to a minus lambda p times i. All right, so uh, the total number of uh, eigenvalues is n, so m1 plus m2 plus all the way to np should be equal to n. All right, so we want to show that uh, this, so we want to show this one. So we want to show that this is a matrix. We want to show that this matrix is zero. All right, so if we can show that this matrix is zero, then we successfully, so take a look at the result here. If PA is zero, that means this is zero. That means AN is indeed a linear combination of AN minus one, AN minus two, all the way to A and I. So that's what we want to show. All right? So the way that we show this matrix is zero is as follows. So we're going to show that uh, the matrix multiplying a non-singular matrix is going to be zero. All right? So that way, this one has to be zero. So uh, more detailedly, this is how it's constructed. So if you take any eigenvector or generalized eigenvector Ti of the matrix A, then uh, we will, we're going to put these eigenvalues, eigenvectors or generalized eigenvectors into this matrix here. So we talked about this matrix is non-single. All right. So uh, we're going to check that we're going to verify that this is zero for sure. All right, so the way we check is by taking a look at the individual columns, PA times T1 times T2, all the way to TN, we're going to be generating zero. All right, so uh, pick any one, let's say TI. So PA times TI is going to be uh, this quantity times TI, so A minus lambda 1 all the way to A minus lambda P and, uh, times TI. All right, so let's think about one by one, term by term. At the end of this multiplication, matrix vector multiplication, we have, we can decompose it into two steps. So it's A minus lambda P power P, uh, MP minus one times, so at the end, it's gonna be this, A minus lambda PI M P minus one times A minus lambda P I times T I. This is the last few terms. And then take a look at this one. It's A T I minus lambda P times T I. So A times T I based on the definition of eigenvector, A times T I is lambda I times T I minus lambda P times T I. Alright? So 
if lambda i equals to lambda p, then this is zero already for sure. We got this zero. If lambda i doesn't equal to lambda p, then we can take out lambda i minus lambda p, right? This is just a scalar. Then uh, this ti gets propagated more into the previous matrix terms. So we're going to have, so take out ti, move it to here. We can consider a minus lambda p i times ti again. So these terms are going to stack up together. All right. So uh, if lambda i doesn't equal to lambda p, in the end, we're going to have these lambda i minus lambda p power to mp. All right. And then uh, the ti is going to be propagating to all the previous terms. All right. So it's going to happen, right? At certain point in the middle, you're going to hit lambda i minus lambda i, right? So at there, uh, you're going to get zero. So the, uh, the, the key takeaway is that if you do this pa times ti, if pi is actually an eigenvector, then somewhere along this multiplication, you're going to get generated at zero. So uh, therefore, if you stack all these up together, then this PA times this non-singular matrix is zero. So uh, therefore, PA is zero. So we have this AN is indeed a linear combination of these smaller terms. All right? So the proof is uh, a few details using this key result over here. But the concept uh, is pretty clear and important. All right? OK. So the K.A. Hamilton theorem gives us this result, right? This gives us the uh, first condition that uh, this controllability matrix, PD, you only need to construct B, A, B, all the way to A, N minus 1, B, this matrix, if it has rank N, then it's going to be controllable. So this is full row rank again. Um, this condition is equivalent to another condition that uh, sometimes it's uh, handy to use as well. So this condition, it turns out, is equivalent to the condition that uh, this is a non-square matrix. This is n times nr matrix. So uh, it turns out you can check the condition for this square matrix to, to identify what is controllable or not. So this is equivalent to the so-called controllability granular defined by this to be non-singular. All right? So this one is uh, it's a summation term. If you write out this summation term, you can see they are actually very closely connected. So this one is actually uh, B, I'm going to write a few terms, A, B, etc., A, N minus 1, B, times B transpose, B transpose, A transpose, B transpose, A, N minus 1, transpose. Right? So this is nothing but, this gramian is nothing but constructed in this way. So it is very similar to the controllability matrix multiplying its transpose, right? So you can see, like, if k is 0, then you get b, b transpose, which is this term times this term. And then you're going to have a, b, b transpose, a, a, b, b transpose, a transpose, and then all the way to a, k, b times b transpose, a, k. This is K, this is K as well. 
So this is nothing but the controllability matrix a little bit modified and then multiplying is transpose. All right. So over here, let's take a look at uh, this condition here. If this is full row rank, this is rank n, so the dimension is like that, then multiplying is transpose. So if this is full rank, if this matrix is full rank, then the result is that this matrix, if you multiply this out, is going to be non-singular. All right? So uh, to see that is you can do this in multiple ways. I'm just going to give you an intuition. All right? So WCD, as we saw, is actually, so let's say, if K1 equal to N minus 1, then WCD is actually nothing but PD, PD transpose, and the dimensions is as follows. This is a square matrix equal to the wide matrix multiplying skinny matrix. So if this is a rank N matrix, so what we want to show that, to show singularity, one thing that we can do is, let's consider uh, eta to be zero. So to show that this is not singular, we can show by analyzing this equation. If WCT is non-singular, that means the only way for this to be zero is what? The eta vector must be zero, right? If this is invertible matrix, this must be zero to make this happen. So we can see that from here. So this is matrix times eta. All right. So this gener generates a vector, a tall vector, right? So this is a tall vector over here. All right. So because this is full row rank, what is the only way for this to generate a zero? So you can uh, take a moment to look at this equation, and the only way for this to be zero is that eta must be zero. All right. Uh, let's take a break, and then you can think a little bit to understand this is true. This has to be zero for uh, this equation to hold, all right? And uh, uh, if we go back one more step and take a look at this, so I want to show you how, very soon, quickly, I want to show you this one. Actually, if you take a look at this, this looks so similar structurally to this guy over here, all right? So there's a little bit of difference in terms of uh, A matrix, whether it's transpose or not. But you can see that this looks very much similar to the solution to a Lyapunov equation. All right, so that's the connection I'm going to make soon. But uh, uh, let's see. First, so PD is full row rank. That means this matrix PD times PD transpose is non-singular. All right, so this is the controllability gradient at K1, this, this uh, summation term, all the way to N over here. All right, so in this case, if you take a look at the original equation that we were talking about, we were talking about what kind of control sequence can we use to stir the initial position to a terminal position. All right, so uh, now with these definitions and these results here, we can see that one solution, one control sequence that we can use is this one. All right, so if PD is full row rank, then you can see that if we do the control sequence is PD transpose times PD, PD transpose inverse, then Xn minus An X0 is going to satisfy this equation, right? So just multiply this to here, 
then you can see PD, PD transpose cancels out with this, and then the left equals to the right. So we can indeed construct this control sequence to let us go from anywhere to anywhere. All right? So that's the uh, concepts and formulas. Now let's put these into practice, and then uh, it's going to be pretty obvious how uh, useful these results are. So let's talk about two examples. The first example is A looks like this. This is uh, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 2, so it contains the Jordan block. And then the B matrix is 0, 0, 1. So let's test the controllability matrix is so it's B, so PD is, we just need to, so N is 3, so it's 3 by 3 here, N equals to 3, so we need to construct PD is going to be equal to B, A, B, A, square B. So three terms, three items in the PD matrix, and uh, B is 0, 0, 1, B, a times B is this times this, so it's going to pick up the last column of A, so it's 0, 1, lambda 2. And then A square B is, so you can compute, usually I prefer to do it, A times AB, so it's this matrix times the columns, the column that I just computed, so this times this, so it's going to pick up the last two columns, is this column plus lambda 2 times the last column. So it's lambda 2 plus lambda 2 times 1, and then it's 0 plus lambda 2 times lambda 2. So it's 2 lambda 2 lambda 2 square, and then that's it. So we need to check whether this matrix is full row rank or not. It has three rows, and uh, I see only two linearly independent rows over here so the rank is the rank of PD is 2 is less than 3 so it's uncontrollable all right so that's from the controllability matrix and from physics this is the same you can conclude so you can see from here x dot from this matrix equation, x dot equals lambda 1 times x1, and then doesn't depend on the input at all. That's the dynamics of the first state. So this is not impacted by the control input at all. Actually, it's, it's not impacted by x2, x3, the other, other state as well. So you can never fully control this state. So it's therefore uncontrollable. So if we go to the earlier example, the two-card symmetric system is the same logic. So uh, here I gave some configurations of these parameters K, B, M over here, and then uh, the system dynamics, I wrote it out. So the most important thing to recognize is that because it's a symmetric matrix, so this term is the same as this term, this structure inside of the A matrix, All right? So same thing here, it's symmetric, so the top two items in the B matrix is the same as the bottom two entries in the B matrix, all right? So if in MATLAB, you can use this, CTRB, controllable matrix, controllability matrix, AB, and then you can construct and get uh, this matrix over here. So you can check the rank of the matrix by computing rank P, and then the result is going to be 2. All right, so 2 is less than, you need full rank, you need full rank, 4, so it's less than 4, so therefore it is uncontrollable.
So that's for this example. All right. So now let's connect the previous concept, controllable canonical form with controllability. So controllable canonical form is, I, I'll take a three by three system, uh, A matrix as an example. So controllable canonical form is this, B matrix has structured 0, 0, 1, and then A matrix has all the coefficients in the last row. So if you check the controllability matrix for this one, it's B, and then when you compute AB, is the last column here, A times B is the last column here, and then A square B is A times AB, so it's going to be adding up the second column plus the last column times negative A2, so it's 1 over here, and then some like uh, 0 plus minus A2, and then negative A1 times negative A2 square, all right, so the most important thing to recognize is that you can see the PD matrix, three rows, you can check all these rows are linearly independent from each other. So you can see here, it's linearly independent from here and linearly independent from here. So the very particular structure of A and B will guarantee you that PD has four row rank. So in other words, system in the controllable canonical form is guaranteed to be controllable. All right? So that's the powerful result. And that's how uh, this canonical form is actually named after. All right. So that's a linkage to a previous concept. So the other linkage to a previous concept is the Gramian, right? So if you take a look at this definition here, the Gramian actually, it requires a lot of additions and multiplications inside, right? So if uh, A is square, if all the eigenvalues of A is less than 1 in magnitude, then as k goes to infinity, this term is going to become 0. All right. So if A is square, then uh, this you can take the summation to infinity and then have this uh, infinite summation term. Now, what is so interesting, what is connected to our previous concept is that this controllability gramian, you don't have to do an infinite summation. You can solve this gramian from a Lyapunov equation. All right? So the way to do that is just a sum matching the terms. So I can see from here, this middle term matrix here is corresponding to B times B transpose. And then the power term so over here, I have A transpose, and then A on the right-hand side. Over there is uh, swept. So A transpose comes first, and then A, A comes first, and then A transpose comes later. So you can see that this, the summation, uh, infinite summation in the controllability gramia is actually nothing but if you construct a modified Lyapunov equation by letting it look like this. So Q is B, B transpose from here, and then you just swap the A matrix terms. So you pull A to the left and then A transpose to the right. Then you can have the you can you can have the summation, infinite summation solution. So that's how the controllability gramia is connected to a Lyapunov equation. All right. Any questions for here? Okay.
So we talked about system in controllable canonical form is always controllable. Now let's talk about general controllable system. All right. So let's talk about, let's say, if a system is originally in controllable canonical form and we apply a similarity transform, x equal to t, some non-singular matrix t times x dot, connecting the two state space equations. Let's see whether a similarity transform, whether similarity transform is going to change the controllability property or not. So we, could, we just need to check the controllability matrix. So here the controllability matrix is uh, B, AB, A squared B, etc. So over here, after the similarity transform, the new A matrix is this, and then the new B matrix is this. So we can check the controllability matrix for the new matrix, new system, is the new B matrix T inverse B times T inverse B times the new A matrix, T inverse, so let's say this is A tilde, B tilde, so it's B tilde, it's A times B tilde, so it's T inverse AT, times T inverse B, all right, so it's T inverse A times B. So you can continue doing this, and then in the end, you're gonna reach T inverse A n minus one times B. And then you can quickly recognize that PD, this new controllability matrix, is nothing but T inverse times the original controllability matrix. So if one of them is full row rank, then the other one is going to be guaranteed to have full row rank because this is a non-singular matrix. So uh, that's more formally, that's how we write it. We usually write that uh, the pair, the matrix pair AB is controllable uh, if and only if this uh, A tilde, B tilde, after similarity transform, is controllable. All right? So, uh, no matter how you do the similarity transform, any coordinate transformation will not change the controllability property. This is something that's intrinsic to the system dynamics. So that's the concept for controllability. Any questions so far? So the second part of today's lecture is about observability. So we talked about the concept is whether we can see from the output and the control sequence to infer the state information. So more formally, this is defined as follows. This linear system in discrete time is called observable at uh, time k equal to zero. If exists a finite time such that we can infer the initial state from the input and the output information. All right, so if we can successfully obtain the initial state, then this is observable. Otherwise, it's called unobservable. We cannot uh, figure out what is the initial state. All right. So how to define 
how to get the initial state out of these system dynamic equations is uh, the, the procedure is very similar to the controllability case. So uh, the key is still figuring out using the system dynamics how we can solve for this initial state. So let's take a look at this here. We know that uh, uh, if we write out a bunch of uh, collected measurements, how they relate to the input, we can quickly see that y0, the initial output, is cx0 plus du0. All right, so y0 contains information about the first, about the initial state. Uh, but uh, it may not be sufficient for us to determine because if you just have one measurement and your state vector is very long, then uh, you are losing a lot of information. In, uh, your, your information is clustered into uh, the output. So if I take a look at the dimension, its dimension is going to look something like this. So let's say if output is a scalar, then this measurement equation is like this. The scalar equals a state is a long vector, and then the C matrix is a wide matrix plus, uh, let's say, U is a single input. So it looks like this. All right, so you just have one measurement that contains a lot of information about the state vector. And then you can continue doing this and see that y1, all right, so y1 equals cx1 plus du1, all right, so so y1 equals cx1 plus du1 and c times x1, x1 is here, x1 is ax0 plus du0 plus du1. So it equals cax0. So the initial state information is in, in first is passed over to the first measurement plus cbu0 plus du1. All right. So uh, if let's see here, for simplicity, I'm gonna use the case for uh, input is zero. All right. So if this input is zero, then uh, the result is easier to write. If they are not zero, then you can see that this is always something that we know. So. This is always something that we know, and uh, if you move this term to the left, then that is about the information about the initial state exclusively. All right, so uh, the point that I want to make is that you can always have this state information, all right? So the state information can always be written as some information about the output minus some information about the input, all right? So this is what we measure. This is something that we know. So we can always have this construction of the linear system equation. All right. So uh, let's, for simplicity, there is some. Uh, for simplicity, let u k to be zero then this is what we're going to have. The output, if we stack them up together, then y0 is c times x0, y1 is c a times x0, and then etc. all the way. We have, again, a matrix equation. So x0 is a vector, and then this matrix uh, Let's see what the dimension looks like. If we have just a single input, if C is a row vector, 
So let's see how the dimension of this one looks like. I have, let's see how many columns here. The column number is equal to how many columns, how many elements in C. So if A is n by n, then if X is n by one vector, so this should have n columns, right? What about the number of rows? So the number of rows is, I have one, two, all the way to n elements over here. So this is uh, at least n rows. And then each item over here, if C is a, let's say, a row vector, then I have precisely n rows. If, let's say, C is uh, M, if I have two measurements, so if C is M by M by uh, M elements, then this is going to have two, it is going to have M rows. So the total number of rows is N times M. All right, so it's going to look like a tall skinny matrix for ND. So the equation that we are talking about is essentially looking like this. We have a tall skinny matrix multiplying a vector. Dimensions are uh, n row, n columns, and then n times m rows times the state vector, which is n by 1, equal to, this is how many outputs we collect. Uh, then it's going to be n times m measurements that we take. So if we want to define, if we want to figure out uh, what is the initial state? We just need to solve this matrix equation. So let's see, under what condition can we figure this out? All right. So in the controllability case, we want the controllability matrix to be full row rank. All right, so let's take a look at here. So the controllability matrix is some kind of wide matrix in that case. So this is what we measure. And then uh, here, these matrix here, this matrix here, similar to the controllability case, this matrix is called observability matrix, uh, denoted as QD. All right, so in the controllability case, we require this to be rank n, and then in the observability case, is very similar. So we require this matrix to be rank n, or in other words, full column rank. You can check by taking a look at this system equation here. If this is full rank, then it turns out this equation can be solved. One quick solution is as follows. So if this is a full column rank, then uh, we can do rank n. Then we can do QD, QD transpose. QD transpose times QD. 
this is going to be a, if you take a look at dimension, it's going to be QD is a long tall matrix, so QD transpose is a wide matrix times a tall matrix. All right, so this is going to be a compact matrix. So if this has rank n, then this is going to have non. This is going to be non-singular. So this equation QD times x zero equal to uh, y matrix, then you can see that this is actually can be solved by this. So one solution is this one. So x0, I'm going to write it out first. You can verify that if you let x0 to be qd, qd, qd transpose qd, inverse qd transpose, and y. So then uh, this is going to be a solution. All right, so let's take a look together. Here, just uh, try, substitute this inside. You're going to get QD, QD transpose QD, inverse QD transpose Y, we want to see whether this equals to Y. So you can see, uh, if you do multiply QD transpose on both sides, you can get you're going to get this. So QD transpose times QD this is going to cancel out, and then uh, the remaining is QD transpose Y equal to QD transpose Y. So a quick verification, you can see that this is indeed a solution to the matrix equation. Right. That's the condition for observability. It's the same thing. It's going to require this matrix here to be full, to have rank n. All right. So same, same to the controllability matrix. And because this is a tall matrix, it's requiring a full column rank instead of the full row rank in PD. All right. So this is very easy to check. Once you write down a bunch of terms, C, C, A, etc., you can usually figure out like what is the rank of this matrix. So in the controllability case, we talked about we talked about the Cayley. Hamilton theorem. Uh, in this case, it's very similar. So you may think, why don't we take a lot of measurements? I can take as many as I want. And uh, it may be hinting that more measurements here will help me to solve this equation. I can solve this x0 if I have a lot of data to use. So the amazing Kelly Hamilton theorem tells you that uh, you don't have to do that. You just need to go all the way to, you just need to com com collect n terms like these. Then you need to, you, you can just stop over there. The uh, underlying reason is very similar. It's again because if you add these terms, CA, n, CA, n minus, n plus one, etc., it's not going to help you to grow the dimension over here because CA, n, uh, a n is a linear combination of i a a n minus one etc. So if you do c a n, it's going to be a all of these is going to be linearly com uh, linear combinations 
of C, C A, C A square, etc., to C A n minus 1. So this won't help you to increase the dimension uh, of the matrix QD over here. Okay, that's the a theorem of the control of the, of the observability theorem. There's one component over there. So, if you want to check whether the system is observable or not, construct this observability matrix C C A all the way to C N N minus one. Check whether it has rank N or not. If it is, then this is. Uh, control observable system. So same thing, we have a observability gramian analogous to the control observability gramian. It is actually also a summation term is a summation that looks like uh, write it out is going to be QD transpose times QD having that kind of structure. So QD transpose times QD is going to be looking something like C transpose, A transpose, C transpose, and then A transpose N minus 1, C transpose times C, C A, C A N minus 1. All right, so very similar to the controllability case. Uh, if this has for has rank n, then multiply this out, it's going to become a square matrix that's non-singular. All right. So that's the observability gramia. This observability gramian, if you take a look at the structure, again, if k is infinity, right, this is again something that looks very much like a solution in this form. Now this time you have q to be c transpose times c, and then uh, a transpose, this is in a good position, this is the same structure over here, so you can solve, if this k1 is infinity, you can solve this observability gramian from a Lyapunov equation. So if the system is uh, stable, if A matrix is square, meaning that uh, the associated system is stable, all the eigenvalues of A are inside the unit circle, then uh, as this power of A matrix goes to infinity, then this term goes to zero. So we can take, in this case, we can take uh, the summation to infinity in the observability gramian case. And then we can solve this gramian by solving this Lyapunov equation, letting Q to be C transpose times C. All right, so that's how the Gramian can be obtained, how it's linked with the Lyapunov equation. So uh, if the condition is that observability Gramian is non-singular, if this is non-singular, then the system is observable. So the system is, uh, in this case, as you can see here, so the observability gramian is in this type of structure is like uh, a matrix transpose times itself. So if this system is uh, if QD is full rank, then this is uh, 
observable implies this is actually even more stronger. This is not only non-singular, but it's actually positive definite, right? So this can be decomposed into like, this is like a square of a matrix. So uh, is non-singular to start with, and uh, just a little bit stronger condition is that this is actually even uh, positive definite. That's how the Gramian can be computed from the Lyapunov equation. So we talked about in the controllability case, uh, if you do a similarity transform, it wouldn't change the controllability. Same thing for the observability. This is some property of the system itself. It won't change whether you apply a similarity transform or not. So you can show this by uh, computing the observability matrix as a take-home exercise. All right? With these concepts, let's take a look at the example and uh, uh, go back to the observability canonical form, canonical form. So let's see why observability canonical, canonical form is actually uh, related to observability. The observable canonical form has this structure. C is in a structure, uh, in a three by three case. It's one, zero, zero. And A is having the first column containing all the coefficients. So if we t construct the observability matrix, we're going to get uh, QD is going to be equal to C, C, A, because it's three by three, so we need to construct three items to C, A square. And then uh, the result is the first row is one, zero, zero. The second row, C times A, is picking up the first row of the matrix, negative A2, 1, 0. And then CA square is going to be CA, last row CA times A. So it's this row vector times this matrix. So you can compute and obtain this is going to be uh, first row a square, a2 square, and then plus the second row minus a1, first row 1, plus the second row 0, and then the last element is first row uh, is negative a2 here. So it's negative a2 times the first row plus the second row. So it's negative a2 here and then 1 here. Again, uh, the key that uh, I want you to take a look is this matrix by construction because of the properties in C and A is going to be single. It's going to be full rank. Rank is N. All right. So uh, the rank is 3. And uh, uh, it's full row rank, full column rank, equals the dimension of the state. So therefore, it is observable. So system, now we see that system in observable canonical form is always observable. All right. Two sets of tools to judge whether a discrete time system is observable or not. In the continuous time case, the very similar result applies. So in the continuous time case, there's always this concept of controllability matrix as well, and the structure is exactly the same as the discrete time case. So P is B, A, B, so you need uh, N such row elements, column elements over here. 
And if this is a rank n matrix, then it is controllable. And then in the continuous time case, slightly different from the discrete time, where we have this uh, summation, we have the integration. So summation becomes integration, and then inside, uh, the construction is very similar as well. So in the discrete time, controllability gramian So in the discrete time case, we have summation uh, from A, K, B, B transpose, A transpose K, summation over K. And in the continuous time is replacing the same B matrix inside, the same uh, B, B transpose inside, and then replacing the discrete time power function into exponential function. All right, so do this for AK and the same for A transpose K. We get the controllability gramia in the continuous time case. All right, so this is from zero to K. So you can see that this is very much similar to this equation over here again. So uh, hinting some relationship, so hinting that the controllability gramian can be solved from the Lyapunov equation as well. So same goes to the observability conditions. So we also check the observability matrix constructed in the exactly the same form, C, C, A, uh, all the way to CA uh, minus 1, and to see whether it's observable or not, just check whether this matrix is rank N or not. And then the Gramian, observability Gramian in continuous time case is similar. So it's replacing uh, summation sign with the integration sign, and uh, inside is C transpose C. Uh, and then E, A, transpose T, etc. So uh, if I put everything into one table, this is what we're going to have. All right, so uh, controllability gramia that uh, we just wrote down is E, A, tau, B, B, tau. So controllability depends on the input vector. Observability depends on the output vector. So two integrations this is A tau, this is A transpose tau, coming first. Uh, discrete time looks like this, so uh, integration becomes summation, both for controllability and observability. By looking at these solutions here, so we can see that uh, the controllability gramia, similar to the discrete time case, can be solved by a continuous time Lyapunov equation. All right. Here, A first, so it's A WC plus WC A transpose instead of uh, uh, in here. If A transpose comes first, then this is A transpose. All right. So here, A transpose comes first, so it's A transpose, the observability gramian, and then A coming uh, to the right-hand side. So that's how the gramians can be computed from the Apnov equations. Let's see, what's the time? So let's finish up today's lecture by comparing 
analyzing this table, you can already see that this gramians actually look structurally connected, right? So in the controllability gramian, we have B, B transpose, and then in the observability gramian, we have C transpose C. So this is a skinning matrix multiplying its transpose. And then over here, C is a wide matrix multiplying C transpose is also a skinning matrix. So this looks very much connected, right? So there is this concept of duality. All right, so if you just take a look at uh, a pair, AB. So AB is controllable, right? So this implies that uh, the Gramian, let's take a look at the discrete time case. So this being controllable means that this Gramian, AK, B, B transpose, A transpose K, is non-singular. All right, so this actually is related. So suppose I have a different system. Suppose I have a system that's constructed as follows. So this system, uh, the A matrix and uh, the C matrix for new system, for different system, is defined as follows. So this new, mat new system, A matrix A bar equals A transpose and the C matrix C bar equals B transpose. And then if I take a look at the observability of this of this system, so if I take a look at the observability gramian, is A bar transpose K, C bar transpose C, A bar to the power of K, all right, so uh, keep in mind what we're doing. I'm saying we have a new system. The AC matrices are connected, are defined uh, by A transpose, B transpose. And I look at the observability gramian. All right, so if this matrix uh, A bar equals A transpose, then you can see that uh, if C bar equals B transpose, you can see that the observability gramian for this system is the same as the controllability gramian of the first system. So if the first system is observable, then the second system must be, if the first system is controllable, then the second system must be observable, right? So this is kind of like a duality uh, between the two systems, all right? So you can see that by just comparing the gramians. Okay, so next time, let's uh, do some examples and uh, uh, finish up the topic.